The MLB playoffs are here. Go Mets. We're looking at the big narratives of this postseason and breaking down a major deal in the media world as DirecTV is poised to buy Dish Network. We also hear from MLB legend and namesake for its most famous surgery, Tommy John. It's Tuesday, October 1st. Welcome to Q4. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we are getting the details and implications of DirecTV buying Dish Network from CNBC's Alex Sherman. Co-host of the Just Baseball show, Jack McMullen, joins for some talk about the MLB postseason. And my colleague, Eric Fisher, talked to Tommy John on his career and the surgery named for him that has changed baseball. We also look at a radical change the SEC and Big Ten are pushing for. First, here are your top headlines. With the MLB postseason beginning today, it's only right to open with some baseball. Luis Arias has become the first MLB player ever to win three straight batting titles with three different teams. In 2022, he batted 316 with the Minnesota Twins. Last year, he was traded to the Miami Marlins, batted over 400 for the first half of the season, and finished with the National League's best batting average of 354. Then, at the beginning of this season, he was traded to the San Diego Padres, where he once again led the league in batting average, finishing off with an average of 318. On a sadder note, NBA Hall of Famer Dikembe Mutombo has died at 58 years of age after a multiple-year battle with brain cancer. Mutombo is best known for his shot blocking and famous finger wag, but he was also one of the NBA's most influential players off the court, in large part thanks to his thorough humanitarian work in his native country of the Democratic Republic of Congo. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver released a statement offering his condolences to Mutombo's family and the global basketball community, which he truly loved and which loved him back. Over to Europe, Italian police arrested 19 AC Milan and Inter Milan ultras, who are essentially super fans of a team, over a connection to the organized Italian crime organization, the Drangheta. The prosecutors allege that they attempted to infiltrate and undercut the legitimate business operations of Giuseppe Miazza Stadium, where both teams play in Milan. This includes ticket, food, and souvenir sales, as well as parking. Some are also accused of drug trafficking. To be clear, the clubs themselves are not believed to be involved in these infractions, but the police clarified that both teams will, quote, have to prove that they have severed any relationship with deviant supporters. The world's most famous golf course, Augusta National, was severely damaged during Hurricane Helene's trek through the southeast. The home of the Masters saw several uprooted trees strewn across the course, as well as flooding. Augusta National Chairman Fred Ridley said, Our Augusta community has suffered catastrophic and historic impact from Hurricane Helene. We are currently assessing the effects at Augusta National Golf Club. To our first big topic of the day, DirecTV is buying the Dish Network and Sling TV. The deal offloads the debt carried by both those companies and hands it over to DirecTV. Why is this deal happening now and what does it mean for the future of the television industry? I spoke to CNBC's Alex Sherman about all of that and that conversation is coming up next. Joined now by CNBC media and sports reporter Alex Sherman. Welcome, Alex. Hi, Owen. Always a pleasure. Yeah, great to have you back on. So, Echo Star, owners of Dish Network and Sling TV, are on the cusp of selling those two companies to Direct TV. What do we know about the deal right now? So, this deal was done because Echo Star was flirting with the notion of going bankrupt, really. They had a $2 billion debt maturity due in November. Uh, and this allows them to avoid that payment because, in essence, they're shipping off the pay TV portion of their business, uh, which also includes wireless spectrum and uh, the rest of the company's sort of ongoing transition into turning into the fourth largest national wireless player. But the way this business has been Uh, run and operated and owned for years now is that there's sort of half the business which is trying to become a wireless provider and the other half of the business which is this declining pay tv asset you know which 10 years ago had 14 million subscribers and today has more like six and that's because the world has long shifted away from bundle linear service to either streaming services or if you do still subscribe to cable In large part, you're probably bundling it with a high-speed wireless service, and satellite TV does not provide that. So both DirecTV and Dish Network are sort of anachronistic in nature. Um, And this deal was proposed 20-odd years ago, and at the time, satellite TV was on the up, and regulators blocked it because they said this would be too much of a consolidation of power to have one large satellite TV company instead of two because it seemed like the next wave of technology then. Now we're in a new era where this seems like old technology. And so now you have two declining companies, one which 
is already a private company when AT&T spun it off and sold part of the business to TPG. As part of this deal, TPG will own the entire direct TV dish company, and it will exist as a privately traded entity, assuming the deal goes forward. Uh, and, you know, I think it basically extends the life of satellite TV by making one larger company with more subscribers, but it doesn't really do anything for the long-term outcome of this company, which I still think is probably, uh, you know, a, a, a slow road to death. Part of the headline for me here is that this deal is probably going to be fine with regulators. I mean, the Biden administration has been more hands-on with this stuff, but, uh, and, you know, more willing to block deals like this, but yeah, it just feels like, what would they be blocking here? These these companies are, um, I mean, yeah, the cable model is, I mean, basically has to consolidate into one giant company to compete with, you know, Apple, Amazon, Google slash YouTube. Um, is that kind of the, basically what's happening here on DirecTV side? Look, I'll give you the counter argument to what I just said, which was that this is the same, this is basically the same playbook that Sirius and XM ran. Again, what was that, 15, 20 years ago, when those two companies appeared to be both on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, and Sirius still exists today and kind of figured out a business model that, that keeps them around. So it is possible that uh, if you make these two companies one, that maybe they are strong enough, or maybe they do come up with a big enough business model, maybe even a new business model if you're you know you have 20 million odd subscribers and maybe you figure something out along the way uh so i think the argument that they're going to use is the same one that those two companies used which was that if you look at the world today uh you know we are a small drop in the bucket of the larger uh overall video landscape and in fact that was they already presented a chart in their conference call today where like the fact that combined these two companies had lost 63% of their pay TV subscribers since 2016. So they're championing, championing the fact that their businesses are suffering. So it's pretty clear mm -hmm. to me that that's going to be the argument that they use for regulators about why the deal should go through. Right. Yeah. And, you know, whereas for press people like us, they'll be saying, you know, this is the new era of TV. Um, in terms of Dish Network, I mean, the Echo Star was in serious debt. Is that because in part, Dish Network is not doing great? Well, it doesn't help, certainly. I mean, the, the company is losing cash flow because there are millions of subscribers that are going out the door. But really, the company was set up in a way that didn't make all that much sense, which was you need to be capital intensive to build out a national wireless network. And you're also operating this other thing that doesn't really have anything, anything to do with a, building out a wireless network. And it is, while it is pumping in cash flow, that cash flow is going in the wrong direction. It's getting lower and lower all the time. So, you know, I think the the CEO went on CNBC today and he basically said, look, operationally, this kind of didn't make sense. It was a distraction. We're sort of operating two businesses that have nothing to do with each other. If you rewind 10 years, Charlie Ergen, who's the you know co-founder of this company, his plan was to marry pay TV and wireless. That was the original incarnation of this, which was, look, you can get all your TV on your phone. And it'll be everywhere. That was in the era of TV everywhere, which was this sort of, uh, you know, half baked notion that all the cable companies would be the ones that would drive the wireless streaming movement. It ended up obviously being Netflix and then each of the media companies going to direct to consumer rather than the bundle sustaining and being the one that everybody subscribed to. So that didn't work. But back then, the thought was the first company that could kind of get to marrying pay TV and video would be the winner. And that was, I guess, the motivation for why AT&T bought DirecTV. That was their thinking too. We'll marry our wireless network and this big pay TV provider. We'll put the pay TV content on the wireless network and allow people to watch their cable from their phone. So it didn't end up working out that way. And now 10 years later, these two companies don't make much sense together. Yeah, right. It's just another another point in that that marriage not quite working out, I guess. In terms of the, you know, the regional sports network model, another thing that is slowly dying, does this extend its life a little bit or just make it you know, maybe keep a few more NBA and NHL teams, you know, from going to the streaming plus over the air equation or any changes to that world you see because of this merger? I don't think so. Um, I think the existential problem of that model exists, like whether or not this deal goes through. 
and the parties that be will make their decisions sort of independent of this transaction. So you're right, maybe that the this breathes a tiny bit of life into that model, but uh, but even that, I'm not really sure happens because that would only be the case if the subscriber decline lessened by these two companies going together. And like even that, I think is still to be determined. Mm -hmm. And for DirecTV, I mean, is this like a desperation move or or just like, you know, smart business play, taking advantage of a dying competitor? Or how does this play for them? For like 20 years, that is the assumption has been that these two companies would eventually come together because okay. <laughs> they do the same thing. And so bringing them together is an obvious synergy play. Now you have a private mm -hmm. equity company that's owning DirecTV. So then it's like doubly more obvious that they're going to be looking for ways to bring in positive cash flow while taking out cost of the business. That is private equity in a nutshell. So this was sort of an obvious transaction from that standpoint. And now that they feel like they can get regular regulatory approval for it, it, it seemed inevitable that this would be uh, the end game here. But, you know, mm -hmm. it is notable that these two companies were each other's biggest competition for many years. And, you know, there was such a thing as a direct TV household and a dish household and direct TV went for sort of the higher end Sunday ticket customers and dish went for the lower end, you know, less expensive, uh, cheaper bundle customer. And they were able to coexist sort of with these two different models. Uh, that world is gone. Direct TV doesn't even own Sunday ticket anymore. So I would imagine over time, the Dish brand is probably the one that will go away and it'll all be DirecTV. But, you know, I think we're sort of even already out of that world where the brands of these two companies are like all that different from each other. Yeah. All right. Alex Sherman, always enlightening. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. Always a pleasure. The SEC and Big Ten are asking for things that no conference would have dared ask for under a four-team college football playoff. Specifically, they would like the 12-team CFP to be a four-team CFP for everyone else. Each conference wants four guaranteed places in the college football playoff. The NCAA could seek to drive all the changes toward having a small number of super conferences with a certain number of guaranteed playoff spots for each, much like the NFL and its divisions and wildcard spots, but that needs to be a holistic change, not just the two most powerful conferences flexing their muscles to make college football less of a meritocracy. If this happens, we're going to see another whole cascade of changes that are just as big as everything we've seen over the last few years. Sticking with football... Baker Mayfield and Tom Brady, with some help from our friends in the media, just put on a textbook display of turning a non-story into a story. It started when Mayfield said this on a podcast in reference to the transition the Buccaneers went from when Brady retired and Mayfield became their starting quarterback. Quote, the building was a little bit different with Tom in there. Obviously, playing-wise, Tom is different. He had everybody dialed in, high-strung environment, so I think everybody was pretty stressed out. They wanted me to come in, be myself, bring the joy back to football for guys who weren't having as much fun. Okay, maybe that last part goes slightly too far. Maybe not. Should we care either way? Not really. But then, of course, Brady has to respond, and he ups the ante. Quote, I thought stressful was not having Super Bowl rings. There was a mindset of a champion that I took to work every day. This wasn't daycare. If I wanted to have fun, I was going to go to Disneyland with my kids. So Brady overreacts and maybe kind of makes Mayfield's point for him. And now they'll keep getting asked about it until this settles down, and they'll probably hash it out soon enough, and we'll see some stories about that, too. I get that this stuff clicks, but the fact that Baker Mayfield said he is less intimidating than Tom Brady does not need to be a multi-day story. This kind of thing, honestly, is why the media can wear some athletes down. As 12 teams prepare for the MLB postseason, 18 are looking at the offseason and some are already making changes, or at least statements. White Sox owner Jerry Reinsdorf put out a letter to the team's fans calling the season a failure, embarrassing, and completely unacceptable. And all of that's definitely true of a year in which they broke the modern record for losses with 121. I've had plenty to say about the system-wide failure of the White Sox this year and about Reinsdorf himself, but you know, this is actually a good letter. It goes into specifics about how the team is revamping their analytics department and offers some hope in pointing out that their AA team won its league championship this year. I doubt he actually wrote this letter himself, and I still wouldn't want Reinsdorf owning a team I was a fan of, but I would want this sort of public accountability after a season like this. And yet, the White Sox are making fewer changes at the top than a team that is consistently average. The Giants fired president of baseball operations Farhan Zaidi, replacing him with 37-year-old team legend Buster Posey. And yes, Posey is a legend at 37 because he was the best player on a team that won three World Series in five years. Zaidi had already started to lose his grip on the team, according to The Athletic, 
Posey, not Zaidi, negotiated third baseman Matt Chapman's $151 million extension. That deal is the franchise's second largest in history behind only Posey's largest deal with the team. The Posey year has made Giants fans and leadership expect more than average, which is mostly what they got under Zaidi. Some teams have a lower bar. Heading over to the MLB playoffs, this postseason is beginning on a strange note after the regular season required a doubleheader the day before the playoffs begin. We also have the potential for MLB's top choice for a World Series matchup and another look at the league's new playoff format and the incentives it creates. I spoke to MLB analyst and broadcaster Jack McMullen about all that and more, and that's coming up next. Joined now by Jack McMullen, co-host of the Just Baseball Show and play-by-play -play announcer with the Pirates AAA affiliate in Indianapolis. Welcome, Jack. Oh, and thank you very much for having me. Excited to talk some uh, some postseason ball, man. Yeah, let's do it. So, yeah, we're heading into the postseason. Do you have an overall narrative heading into these playoffs? I know Tim Kirkjins is anybody can win it, and I could probably just lift that from him and roll with it. Um, I, I do think this is as wide open as I remember a postseason being, and I don't necessarily think there are teams that are deficient in certain aspects. I think that there are not a lot of teams that are near flawless. I think that we often see one or two teams that are, you know, considered flawless or very close to it. I think about, you know, the Atlanta Braves some years where they come in and, and they run out frontline pitching and they have an elite bullpen and they have Ronald Acuna in that lineup and Austin Riley in that lineup. That's not the case anymore. And even with a team like the L.A. Dodgers, who had a billion dollar offseason, right, with Otani and Yamamoto, they're still running out a rookie in the National League Division Series, you know, projected starting rotation that Dave Roberts announced in Landon Knack. Walker Buehler has a five and a half ERA. There are weak spots, I think, in every team, which is very exciting. And that, and that makes for some parity. I think that's why people love the NCAA tournament in basketball, right? Yeah, I mean, this is the direction MLB has been moving, and they've been trying to find this balance. We have this 162-game regular season, which does a pretty good job of sorting out who's better than who. Yeah. And then we have these playoffs where the 84-win Diamondbacks can can go to the World Series. And, of course, and I should say we're recording this before we know if they are in, the, um, in these playoffs, but the Rangers are out. The Diamondbacks, if they get in, it'll be with a, a lot of luck and in the last wild card spot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the baseball just kind of has to live with this juxtaposition of they want some chaos in the playoffs, but it feels a little, uh, a little weird after, you know, we, we just spent six months figuring out who the best teams are. No doubt. And I, I think what you just uncovered was you know, the rest versus rust conversation. And that became very apparent. I think over the last week or two weeks, when you revisit the idea that, Texas started a wild card series on the road last year in Tampa and Arizona started a wild card series on the road last year. I think it was in Milwaukee off the top of my head, but you know, those were not teams that were supposed to be in the fall classic. And I'm not sure if Fox wanted it, if they wanted a, a Rangers diamondbacks world series, but they got it and they didn't take days off. And you could talk about the certain number of days off that Spencer Strider had leading into a postseason loss. And things like that. So I, I do think that that is a conversation that can be had. And, you know, the expanded postseason, are you going to get some teams that, you know, should have been on the outside looking in in, in previous formats? Sure. But that also kind of it aids the randomness and I think enhances the randomness for the fan and for the baseball diehard. They love it because you can have teams that get hot at the right time for the casual fan. You kind of want to see Yankees, Dodgers. You kind of want to mm -hmm. see the Astros or the Phillies markets like that. Yeah, right. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the the expanded playoffs, there's just, an, I think, an inherent good to there being now twelve fans of 12 teams that get to enjoy the playoffs and fans of whatever, 14 to 18 teams that have hope, you know, very late into the season, um, you know, hope hopes what we're selling here. You're so right. um, and yeah, you mentioned Yankees Dodgers how how big a dream is that for MLB itself to potentially see that World Series matchup I, th I think it's a massive like that would be that would be the goal and you get New York and LA and you get the coast to coast appeal of this and you get the cross country flight which I know is bad for the players but I feel like it is good for the baseball market in general and at the end of the day you get Judge and Otani and yeah. Aaron Judge Shohei Otani are, are the two big selling pieces in Major League Baseball right now I would love to see Chris Sale throw again in the World Series, but I will tell you the allure of Chris Sale 
is not getting people to turn on their TVs. The, the allure of Shohei Otani, the first guy ever to go 50-50 in a given season, 50 homers and 50 stolen bases versus the guy that just broke Roger Maris's, you know, American League and quote unquote clean home run record uh, two years ago and just put up, I, I think, the best slugging season from a right-handed hitter ever. He slugged over 700 this year, um, at least by you know some of the advanced metrics, was considered the best offensive season we've seen from a right-handed hitter ever. And we're talking Bonds and Ruth and Ted Williams being in that conversation with him, and they all you know hit on the other side. So I, I think the two big superstars in the game matched with New York and LA markets would be the dream for Major League Baseball. And listen, like, it's still going to be fine regardless. I, I know Diamondbacks Rangers still pull decently well, but I mean, you're, you're operating in another stratosphere. If you do get that, that Yankees Dodgers fall classic. Yeah. And you know, last year it was a big bump for MLB in the regular season, both fans showing up to the games and watching games, you know, is largely credited to the pitch clock, maybe some of the other new rules of, you know, just re-engaging fans uh, and not just as a curiosity thing. They, you know, stuck around for most of the year. Then you get to the World Series and, and yeah, it was, it was kind of lackluster viewership wise, uh, especially compared to, you know, that elevated regular season because, uh, yeah, those aren't huge markets. Um, and maybe that says something about, you know, the Rangers or MLB's ability to, to market, you know, pretty big uh, geographic area or population area. But um, and I guess same with the Diamondbacks. Now that I'm thinking of it, anyway, <laughs> not considered huge baseball markets. Certainly not New York and LA. And yeah, we absolutely could end up with you know Cleveland, Milwaukee. Like those are two good teams, and yeah. uh, would could for baseball fans would be a fun matchup for the league. They'd be saying you know oh well you know better luck next time I guess. I, I think so, and they can always pivot to you know the selling points that you have there. Um, you know, when, when you look at the smaller market teams that are in here, Detroit, who do you sell? Well, you sell the guy that just won the pitching triple crown in the American league. Tarek Skubal just led yeah. the American league in, in ERA and wins and in strikeouts. You know, if you have a Cleveland in the world series, you get a Jose Ramirez who was a home run away from a 40, 40 season. And who, you know, I, I know a lot of the pub in, in, you know, the last decade or so has gone to Manny Machado and Nolan Arenado, but over the last five years, He's been the best third baseman in baseball. They they can position themselves in a way to pitch, I think, every single team here when it comes to here's why you should tune in. Uh, but it gets way easier when you have a Bryce Harper and Philadelphia or you have, you know, Shohei, Aaron Judge, like we talked about. So as we mentioned, we don't know uh the last two teams in the National League because right now, as we're recording, the Mets and Braves are playing this double header. Um, that was not supposed to be on the schedule yeah. um, and create some weird incentives around the team that wins the first game is just going to probably try to rest everyone in their, the second game to uh, prepare for the wild card series that they know they'll be in. Anyway, how big a screw up is this by MLB and maybe by the teams themselves to be in this situation? I, so I don't necessarily want to call it a screw up on anybody because at the end of the day, these were natural elements in, in Helene that, you know, made their presence felt with no time left to adjust. Where were you going to find, you know, other ground? Because the weekend series were necessary. They were incredibly important. So, OK, this happens in a midweek. You have this designed open date. I'm not saying that this is a preferable situation, but it is a situation that it feels like there were some guardrails in place to deal with if you needed to deal with it. And, and I think they did a pretty decent job of that. Now we'll see what happens this week in the wild card series with the two teams that do get in because, you know, assuming, sorry, I know you're a Mets fan, but assuming the Mets hold and, and they do win game one. Okay. You're in the concrete thing is Lindor likely doesn't play because he's been beat up Francisco Lindor, the shortstop for the Mets. So now Atlanta down a game, needs to burn the National League Cy Young Award winner, or at least I think, in, in Chris Sale, their lefty, and he will not be able to go in that wild card series. So I, I do think from a baseball strategy perspective, they're, you know, you, you're looking at, at the league and saying, how could you let this happen? We're not going to get our best product on the field in the postseason, but you got to get there first. And, and it feels like this was the best, the easiest, the simplest way, and frankly, the only way for them to get this right. Yeah, I mean, I, I've sort of been on both sides of this in my own mind right. in the last 24 hours, basically, right. um, of, you know, like, on one hand, 
they could have just had a find a neutral site but you know there's reporting that they needed to do that by i think on sunday for a wednesday and thursday game and we knew a hurricane was coming we we didn't know you know exactly how bad it was going to be is it necessarily going to cancel these games it seems obvious now like yes it's a hurricane like in the southeast yes it's going to cause rainouts in atlanta no um doubt. but um but yeah i mean it, it i think the forecast may have worsened in that time and um and it, i mean it's exciting i mean this is effectively another wild card game um and maybe the weird incentives might have been there or at least it's possible to have them where um the team that the diamondbacks needs to win is not going to be one that's going to be playing their best players um you right. get those situations at the end of the season sometimes anyway of yeah. the yeah the team that's that just got in is gonna give everyone else the day off on the Anyway, these things can happen. It is a little weird. I mean, if like it's very uncomfortable for the Diamondbacks to like not know who to root for, but also whoever you're rooting for is going to be um, not not throwing the game, but like also not trying very hard. Right. Like you're sitting there and your stomach hurts for the first three hours of your Monday. And then the, the back three hours of your Monday, you are the biggest, you know, Atlanta Braves fan ever, or you are the biggest New York Mets fan ever. Yeah. And you just don't know which one you're siding with. And, you know, I, I think the confusion honestly adds to a little bit of the romantic aspect of baseball where it's like, who am I going to be a super fan of this afternoon? We'll figure yeah. this out at three <laughs> o'clock and, and we'll have closure by six o'clock, which is great. But yeah, I, I, I know like, there are there are so many different emotions that I feel like have gone through so many Mets fans, so many Braves fans, so many Diamondbacks fans' heads. And at the end of the day, you're entirely right, Owen. Like you see so many teams that have locked up their seed in the postseason that essentially mail that Sunday in. Here, I think baseball is probably the hardest place to exactly identify where momentum comes from. But who's to say if the New York Mets, you know, they, they have this great comeback in the eighth inning in game one, they win game two. Who's to say they don't have momentum? And, and you can look at it one of two ways where, hey, we're really hot. We just had a big doubleheader sweep yesterday and we get to go take that momentum into a wild card series. Or we just played two games 24 hours ago when you played zero and we were operating at a disadvantage. I, I think baseball is probably the cloudiest sport to deal with that. Basketball, you know, you prefer the day off. Football, you prefer the week off. Baseball, what do you prefer? You do it every day for yeah. six months anyways. Right, yeah. And I, I feel like whatever happens in the everyone will will be able to have their narrative of like exactly. well of course they just played a doubleheader of course they stunk and like or they yeah they they had so much like steam coming in from that doubleheader like they just like went right over to milwaukee and, and destroyed them right you know, and, and that's what happened last year with like all the the top seeds losing exactly. um i guess except for the astros right um and everyone's like well yeah they just you know they were like sitting around while another team just yeah. like you know it came off this big exciting wild card series right. so i i feel like it's the sort of thing where we need like 10 years of data to like really know and um but we're, we're not gonna wait on our takes for 10 years no doubt it's like a choose your own adventure book but it's it's based on agendas too it's like oh i can kind of pick my own agenda here which is is great if you don't have a firm one set in stone beforehand so then you can just kind of decide whether you feel disrespected or you know validated by the outcome of these wild card series it's great yeah. All right. Well, uh, well, I guess we'll leave it there and see what happens. Um, Jack McMullen, thanks so much for joining us on the show. You bet, Owen. Tommy John first broke into the major leagues at the age of 20, and he pitched until he was 46. While he has not been on an MLB roster since 1983, we hear his name multiple times a year because of the surgery named after him. He spoke to my colleague, Eric Fisher, about his very unique legacy, and you'll hear that next. We are here with uh, Major League Baseball legend Tommy John. Uh, many veteran fans know him for his illustrious career over 26 seasons, uh, three pennant winners, uh, 288 victories, uh, one of the most durable pitchers in modern history. But that durability came through his namesake surgery mid-career, had ligament reconstruction surgery that has changed the face of the game. And we are talking with Tommy John on the 50th anniversary of that surgery. Welcome, Tommy. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, you know, people have asked me all about the surgery, and I said, the big guy upstairs had to 
had to like me because I was in the right city, the right ball club at the right time when I had to have the surgery. I was with the Dodgers. Our team physician, orthopedic, our team surgeon was a guy named Frank Job. And Job was the one that came up with the Tommy John surgery. So, like I said, somebody wanted me to come back and play again. So, literally half a century later, we're talking on the anniversary of that surgery. Um, it's helped to change the face of the game, of course. Uh, but you went on and had this fantastic second half of your career. As you look at on that personally, and then what this surgery has done across the game, what are your reflections this half century later? Well, I think the big thing is all the pitchers that have had it at the major league level and, you know, even position players have had it, but it goes, but the thing that gets me is these kids uh, 12, 13, 14 are having Tommy John surgery. You shouldn't have it at that age. You know, come on, man. And, but it's parents that get talked into doing um, all these shows and, and tryouts and stuff because we can get your son a, a scholarship to this university or we can get him here, we can get him there. And they buy into it. And, um, you know, and the kid hurts his arm for throwing too much, too hard. I'm glad you brought that up because as the game continues to evolve, we're, we're really sort of almost at a juncture point, perhaps even a crisis point in terms of pitchers. Um, you were obviously known for your durability before and after the surgery, being able to go deep into games, go on three days rest, that sort of thing. Those days are obviously long gone and everybody's at max velocity now in terms of, instead of trying to hit spots like you did. Um, and, uh, you know, now we're at a situation where people are complaining that, you know, there's no star pitchers in the game and there are certainly not as many as before. And right. this is part of what's going on, that there's such an emphasis on max velocity. Um, how how do you sort of see the state of your position at this point in time? Well, I think hopefully people with cooler heads and smarter heads will take over. And, you know, the, the game of baseball, is not difficult. Seven outs. You got to get 27 outs. How do I get 27 outs? Can I strike 27 guys out? No. Can I do this? No. I found out that if I sank the ball, took a little off, little curve ball, fastball here, I could get 27 outs or somewhere close to 27 and not really – be hurt that much and um you know it, it's just pitching is throwing to spots and changing speeds throwing strikes guys can't throw strikes anymore well they can but they're you know it, it's not like it used to be so if you were in an active coaching role or an active player development role would that be the sort of thing that you'd be telling your charges at this point? Or what, if you were in that role, what would you be saying? I had a coach when I came over from the Cleveland to the White Sox. Pitching coach, his name was Ray Barrios. And Ray was the best I ever had. And he was ball out of your glove early, get your arm up and throw strikes. We were talking and, he said, you know, after you pitch, sit back and think about how you did, what you could do better, what what you could do worse, and try not to go worse, try to get to better. And it made sense. Okay, I, I see that. But, um, you know, I think now it's just speed, 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 speed. So as you – look upon your own career uh you know the conversation about tommy john and the hall of fame still comes up periodically we have the era committees now with the hall of fame um how do you sort of feel about your own potential candidacy not just the 288 wins but certainly what's happened with the surgery if if i get in the hall of fame i get in the hall of fame if i don't i don't 
I know how well I pitched and I know what I did. And you can't have a bunch of guys sitting back scraping their ass on the chair saying, oh, he deserves to be in. He doesn't. You know, if if you pitched 26 years like I did and you won 288 games and you had 188 no decisions, which is the most in baseball history, you've done something right. And if you've done something right for that long, then you should be in the Hall of Fame. Similar question. I mean, obviously, everybody knows that it's it's called Tommy John surgery. Your the name lives on literally right. every day as this discussed. Is that something that you're comfortable with in terms of it being being talked about in this medical context? How do you sort of feel about that? Well, if I'm not comfortable with it, I better get comfortable with it. <laughs> it's obviously been a thing. Yes, it's going to it's been a thing. It's going to be a thing. And uh I didn't, I didn't name the surgeon. Dr. Job did. So if anybody's got any problems with the surgery, could get on him. We're in this golden age of sports documentaries right now. And, and uh, I'm understanding there's one in development around your life and journey. Uh, tell me about what's happening there and when we might be able to expect to see it. Well, it's me and Pete Getty Combs are doing the documentary with his get away from there uh the name of the uh documentary it, it, it it's going to be out it will cover it's coming out in 2025 and the producer director is a guy named nick hagan from minneapolis minnesota and they will be re releasing it and it's going to follow me through my Terre Haute roots, uh, the surgery, the minor leagues, the big leagues, the surgery, and what I'm doing now. And, um, you know, so when when we get it all done, people are going to, uh, oh, you know, he was a pretty good pitcher. He was a pretty good pitcher. And Nick and his group are putting together a feature film about me. Uh, the same thing, and I, I don't know who's going to play me in the film, uh, but I hope it's somebody like uh, Wyatt Earp or, <laughs> or Matt Dillon or something like that. <laughs> well, Tommy John, you've uh, added yet another dimension to uh, what we knew about you. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, very accomplished uh, on the field, a uh, medical trailblazer, uh, and now golf commentator as well. Thank you very much. Yeah spending this time with us. You're quite welcome. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. MLB did not come out and say they made multiple large mistakes regarding uniforms, but actions speak louder than words. The league announced that players will return to wearing their regular home and away uniforms during the All-Star Games, ditching the custom-made All-Star jerseys they've used since 2019. Teams will return to their regular hometown jerseys in the All-Star Game, resuming a tradition that dates back to the 1930s. That's not the only change coming to MLB uniforms. After a controversial start to the season involving low-quality materials and see-through pants, the league will be implementing full pant customization, larger letters on the backs of jerseys, and the return to previously used materials that the players requested. Players should start seeing their old, comfortable uniforms by the start of the 2026 season, so MLB players just need to power through one more year of this. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, share it with a friend. If you're on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.